my bills are coming due, Lord, and six days is not that long. She hears a voice so soft and low, says I moved like that before, and I'll do this little thing.
You know what? I'm glad the devil's mad because we got one he thought he had. Colin, stand up. Where you at, buddy? That young man got saved a while ago. Amen. 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 Now, there'll be those who'll say, well, he was just too young. Just too young. You know what? I'm going to leave it in the hands of God. Right? I believe that, son, that boy, he'd been taught all his life about Jesus. He's, he's taught it at home. He's taught it in his education. He's taught about Jesus here at church, Bible school, Sunday school, from this pulpit. He knows about Jesus. And he knows he wanted him to be a savior. And he come and ask him to be saved. And he says he's saved. That's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. Let's give God a great big hand clap of praise. <clears throat> Oh, Jordan's back with us today. Ain't he, Jordan? Yeah. He was here Wednesday night, come walking in here like a brother in Christ that he is. Yeah, he got saved last Sunday. Give God a great big hand clap of praise. And then there's others in Bible school that got saved, and we're going to have a big baptizing. And you say, Brother Gary, you always say big baptizing. I don't care if it's one or 100. It's a big baptizing when you have baptized. That means something big has happened. And the biggest thing that can ever happen to you in life is to know Jesus as your Savior. And if you're here today and lost, God wants to save you. I don't know the mind of God. I certainly can't instruct Him. But I do know what He said. He wants you to be saved. And He will save you if you'll come believing that He is. And you know what? Then there will be battles and trials and troubles. And we've sang about all about those things this morning. But He will never leave you. Or He's going to be right there for you. He's going to be right there for you. And when you fail, He can't fail. God can't fail. When I fail, God don't fail. I fail. I do. And then He's got a remedy for my failures. If I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Well, Brother Gary, I just don't sin. The Bible says you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. I'm just being plain. Right? I'm just being, I'm just telling you the Bible. I want you to know that God loves you today, that He can save you if you want to be saved. He'll save you. None of this stuff, election, none of this stuff, predestination as far as your salvation. He knows everything. He knows you'll be saved or whether you'll be lost. He knows that, but it's up to you to choose, okay? It's up to you to choose. Let's give praise to His Word. And then we're going to preach about an hour and a half. This is my Bible, Bible. the Word of God, God. inspired, Inspired. infallible, Infallible. inerrant, Inerrant. alive, powerful, powerful. preserved, preserved, Preserved. sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth will pass away. away. God's Word will never pass away. away. (laughs) I will make it a lamp unto my feet. A light into my path. path. I will hide its word in my heart heart. that I may not sin against God. Give him a big hand clap of praise. (laughs) Praise. (laughs) Sister Diane, I I, I love you girls. Good to see you back at church. I don't think I got to you. She's been gone a couple of Sundays. She's got a grandson, Noah, that's at the hospital in Louisville. I trust he's doing well. And God's a good God. All right, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Chapter 11. We're going to take the Lord's table today. Now, when we take the Lord's table, I don't always preach the message on the Lord's table, but I'm going to touch on it a little bit today with God being my helper. <clears throat> in case I forget it, while you're turning, we got a big meeting tonight up on the courthouse square. On the courthouse square at 6 o'clock, we're going to have church, guys. How do you know? Because the head of the church will be there. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And we're going to have a big time in the Lord. Last month was a good, a good evening. People worshiped. We heard the word of God. <clears throat> Wonderful singing. And I don't expect any less tonight except out of the preacher. He probably won't compare to the last month. But if the preacher comes by, we'll have a good time anyway. All right? In, in, in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to start reading down about 
verse 23, verse 23, very familiar to all of you, all of you. He said, this is the great apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. For I have received of the Lord. He didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from James. He didn't get it off the internet. He didn't get it from a dried up presbytery. He didn't get it from the deacon board. He didn't get it from a hotshot pastor or evangelist. He said, I have received from the Lord. I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you. And he loved this phrase, didn't he? Didn't he love that, I, that which I also deliver? He said that in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and, no, 1 and 3. He said, I, 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 receive, I give unto you what I have received of the Lord, how that Jesus died for my sins according to the scriptures. He, he loved, you can tell Paul's writings, but just how he approached subjects. I deliver unto you that, the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. <clears throat> After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, <clears throat> whosoever shall eat the bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. <clears throat> In the house of God, here at Duval's Chapel, we bless your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for what we've already experienced. We thank you for uh, the wonderful experience of salvation, how Colin has come, Lord, and bowed his heart. And one day after a while, because of this experience, he will live forever in heaven in glory. I thank you for that. I thank you for a mama that loves Jesus more than life and loves her family enough, God, to tell them about you. I thank you, God. For this hour, help me to preach this message, not for fame nor for fortune, but to bring you glory and honor and salvation in that name. We pray in, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. What a great message. What a great message. Listen, I can't do it just. I have never done the word of God justice. I have never. I've been preaching 50 years, hundreds, thousands of sermons. I've never done the word of God, or no, I don't feel like I ever have. You just can't do it. This right here is, it's more than enough, as the old preacher said, isn't it? It's more than enough. It's what every soul needs, this right here. It's what every soul needs. I don't care where you, your nationality, your, your, the dialect that you speak, your educational level, financial status. It doesn't matter your position in society. Every soul needs this right here, the Word of God. You know when you're saved, you are born by the Word of God. Ain't that what it says? We are begotten by the Word of God. You say, no, no, I'm begotten by the Holy Spirit. It's, they're inseparable. They're inseparable. The Word of God is Jesus Christ, guys. He is. I quote this scripture over and over. Y'all get tired of hearing it. I, thought, I never get tired of hearing the Bible. Well, you have now because I quote John 1 and 1 all the time, don't I, guys? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that is made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shined in darkness. And you know what the Bible says? The darkness couldn't do anything about it. And the King James says, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the word comprehended it not out of the Greek simply means it couldn't do anything about it. It couldn't stop the light. Darkness can never stop the light, even naturally. This morning, I'm up every morning before daylight. I tell you, like one, one person said, God only gives us so many sunrises and we don't need to miss very many of them, right? So I'm up every morning. Oh, I, I'm, I'm safe in saying that. Almost every morning before daylight, but every time, about 5 o'clock now, things start lightening up. Before, long before you see the sun, the darkness gives way to light. 
That's what happened with sin when Christ came into this world. The darkness of this world and the darkness that was under the law of sin and death that God instituted through Moses by the dispensation of angels had to give way to the light. In him was light and the light was the life and the life was the light of man. That's where we're at today. That man, Jesus Christ, came into this world to save the world, to give light to darkness, to change hearts, to change minds, to establish the greatest entity on, entity on this planet, and that's the church of the living God that we're all a part of if we're saved. You know, we got a nickname over this building, and it's Duval's Chapel General Baptist Church. But the name really of the church is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the one we can rejoice in today. So why, what are you, what are you, what, what is it that's on your heart today, Brother Gary? I just want to talk about exactly what I read to you. What I read to you. Paul is writing to a church that he loved Mike more than life. I believe that. I believe that every pastor, any pastor that's worth his salt, loves the church more than himself, loves the church more than life. If, if, if the shepherd would not give the life for the sheep, he's a harling. Ain't that what Jesus said? He's a harling. In other words, he just hard himself out and it don't mean nothing. It's like, it's like you renting a car. Like I got one out there. The GM gave me cause. That big truck of mine is no good. It quit on me. I hate to say it, but it did. So I've got this car, and, and I'm driving this car, and I won't treat this car like I did my truck. I took care of my truck. That's a rental car. That's a rental car. I'm telling you, listen, I'm telling you, we are the church. We belong to Christ. He belongs to us, and he is special today. And the pastor ought to love the church not as a hard, a rented car or a rented something like he owns it, like it's a part of him. And we all take ownership of it because we're the body of Christ. So Paul loved these people. How in the world, if you know the history of this church, Corinth, how could he love this church? Because he was God's man. I'm telling you, as God's people, we need to look across the aisle in the church and love one another. Well, you don't know what that person, I've heard it all. What that person's done to me, you don't know what you've done to somebody. We're all guilty. We all fall short. Yeah, we, except for grace, there go I. There I am. Except for the mercy of God, there I am. So Paul loved this church. So what was going on? Everything you can think of. This church was established by the great apostle Paul in one of the most ungodly cities. It was the Las Vegas of that era. It was high cultured. It was a, a, a great community of wealth, but it had its vices and its, its ills because it was a Gentile city. Oh, they was doing everything in this place. Did you remember when he wrote to this church and he said it's a shame for a woman to cut her hair short or to shave her head? You remember that? And some religions have built a whole religion around that with their women. All he was talking about that at Corinth was the temple of Aphrodite or the temple of uh, 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 that where they, they worshiped this goddess of fertility. And in this temple, they had temple prostitutes. And I'm not being ugly. I'm just telling you what the word of God teaches. And they prostituted themselves to the men that come there to worship this goddess. And they was having a time. And business really picked up. Because of the lust of the flesh, it picked up. But guess what? This old boy called Saul of Tarsus that got his name changed, Paul the Apostle, went in there preaching Jesus and something happened. Souls started getting saved. And people that once was addicted to drugs and sex and alcohol and all of the evils of that society got cleaned up real good. Lives were changed. And now the church was established, but they didn't have First and Second Corinthians and Ephesians and Philippians and all of the books of the Bible. So God was would inspire these apostles to write and he wrote and he told them he said women don't shave your head don't crop your hair off because you're going to look like the prostitutes that come out of the temple he wasn't against them cutting their hair he was against the ungodliness of that day 
and he didn't want them to identify themselves with that ungodliness. We ought to get back to that in the churches. Thank you. So he wrote to them. I've often said most general Baptist pastors or Baptist pastors would have given up on this bunch of people as they're giving up on people today. I'll tell you one thing. God didn't give up on the church. God will never give up on the church. And the Methodists have closed their doors. And the Baptists are starting to follow suit. But there will be faith here when Christ comes again. And it will still be called the church of Jesus Christ. It will. And so he dealt with it. You say, well, how could it get any worse than that? Let me tell you about 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was a man in the church that's having a, 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 a sexual affair with his stepmama. That's how bad it got. You think things are just happened today? No. They've always been around because sin has always been around. But God didn't give up on the church. He didn't give up on court. And he had a man called Paul that was inspired and God gave him revelation of what needed to be said and he pinned it in three different books and only two of them are canonized into the Bible. But there were three to begin with. Now watch this. And so it came right down. It came right down to the Lord's table. And I want you to get this. There's two ordinances of the church today. The deacons can tell you what they are. Most of you Christians can tell you what they are. Baptism and the Lord's table. What is that? An ordinance is basically a rule or a law. If you want to be a member of a Baptist church, and I'm not preaching Baptist. I've never asked anybody to be a Baptist. I'm just talking this way because we are one. I am one. As the little boy said, I are one. So if you want to join the Baptist church, you're to be baptized after you're saved. Neither ordinance will save you or justify you. Neither one. Now, there's religions that says baptism will justify you. There's others that says the body and the blood of Jesus, the communion, will justify you. Neither one of them will. The only, one that, the only thing that will justify you is the blood of Jesus Christ by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But because we are the body of Christ... God demands some things. And one of them is baptism. If you want to, if you really want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, forget the church membership at Duval's Chapel. You are to be baptized. Why? Because you are being buried in the spiritual sense. It's, it's like a, a an allegory. It's like it's like an illustration or an allegory or uh, that you, are being, you have been buried with him in baptism and you have been resurrected to a new life. That happened when you got saved. But now you're showing the world how you got saved and you're going to walk with Jesus. And then there's the Lord's table. You know why they gathered in the upper room? It was Passover, wasn't it, Hannah? Wasn't it Passover in Jerusalem and there was more than a million people that had gathered there every year to, to, to uh, take the Passover and, and the city was bustling with, with, uh, with, with, with pilgrims that come there and in every house, every Jewish house, whether at Jerusalem or anywhere else in Israel, they had slain the lamb and they had made the unleavened bread and they were going to eat the Passover. They had been doing this for 1,400 years. 1,400 years from the time that Moses, Moses left and the children of Israel left Egypt's bondage. You remember how the death angel came and God said, Moses, this night will be a night of remembrance, the beginning of, of life from now on for the Jewish people. Everything starts new tonight. Why? Because I'm going to pass over Egypt. And the firstborn out of every house will die. The firstborn of every cow. The firstborn of every animal. The firstborn of the slaves. The firstborn of the, Pharaoh's throne will die tonight that does not have the blood of the lamb applied to their doorpost. So for 1,400 years they kept the Passover. It was, it was mandatory that they eat the Passover. They eat it every year. It was God's way. 
for them to remember what he did that day in Egypt. He set the captive free, didn't he? Huh? He set the captive free, two, three million of them come out of Egypt that day and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years but they kept the Passover by faith according to the book of Hebrews. Now Jesus is here and actually he was the Passover, wasn't he? The, the, the unleavened bread represented his body for 1,400 years and the blood, the cup that they drank of, uh, of, of grape juice represented his blood for 1,400 years. And now Jesus is here. No longer a shadow, no longer a type, but the image is here. The one who had cast the shadows the one the types were all about. He was here. And he told them to go down to Jerusalem, go into that upper room. You'll see a a man carrying a pitcher of water and he'll take you to an upper room and there you prepare for the Passover. It would be the last Passover that Israel could ever, ever eat, would ever eat, and it represents something because Christ was about to fulfill it. He went into that upper room his 12 totally mean out of the Arabic, Arabic, I should say, language set around him, 12. I know there's a lot of debate on how old these boys were. We see them in the Lord's Supper, that painting, and they're all old men with beards, aren't they? Probably the most of them were boys, just boys in their teens. And they, and they set around him. And he told them of the passion. And he said, somebody's going to dip their their bread in the same cup that I dip. And he's going to betray me. And Peter said, John asked the master who. John was special to Jesus. He said, John asked the master who. Judas dipped his sop with Jesus and then left. And the destiny was sealed. But actually it was sealed before the foundation of the world. God had this plan. God cannot fail. It was all coming together. It was all coming together. The last Passover. The last Passover. A few hours later, they came and got him in the garden. Judas kissed him. And the the soldiers took him away. At 6 o'clock, at 9 o'clock in the morning, they would nail him to a cross. At 12 o'clock, the earth would become black. And at 3 o'clock, he would give up the ghost. He would die. He would die. But he said, from now on, when you eat this, you do it in remembrance of me. You do it in remembrance of me. Now, what what did Paul say? What what did he say? He he quoted Jesus is who he quoted. And he said, "I, I got this from Jesus. I received it from the Lord. How did he do that? By the Holy Ghost. This is divine. This was, this was revelation that, that ended at the end of the book of Revelation. And he said, take, eat, take, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat of it, you do it in remembrance of me. I want to challenge all of you to go home and read Isaiah 53 when you get home. 600 years before Christ, 700, he told of this this event, the crucifixion, and how Jesus would be brutally beaten and and become beyond recognition, and he would the 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 demonic spirits would come around the cross. He called them the bulls of Baston. If you study that out, it was demonic spirits that come to the to the cross where Jesus was. The devil was having a field day, but the will of God was being fulfilled. And Jesus died on that cross. And he said, now when you eat this this morning, and when he spoke this to Paul, he was looking 2,000 years ahead down to Dubas Chapel. And he said, when you eat this, you do it in remembrance of me, my body that is broken for you. How soon we forget. It's beyond my understanding How some little old stupid something can happen in the church and half the church get up and leave. I don't know nothing. 
When I came here five years ago, I told these deacons, or the, I told the pulpit committee, I don't want to know anything. I'm not going to look behind me. I'm going to look ahead. But it's sad. It is. It really is. I've seen churches divide over just about everything. This church, Corinth was divided. You know what they were doing? Over preachers. You know, when I leave here, and I'm not here, I go on vacation or whatever, I want the best preacher I can find to fill this pulpit. There's about two or three y'all I'll use that's not busy, that's not always busy. I want the man to come and preach the word of God. He may not spit on everybody on the front row like I do or the first three rows. He may not stomp around and, and run or whatever, but he preaches the word of God. And that's all that matters is the word of God, not the presentation or the deliverance, but the word of God. That's what matters. That's what we need to get back to. They said, some of them said, I'm of Paul. Paul's my preacher. He's the man. I won't even go to church if Paul's not preaching. Others said, no, Apollos. Oh, Apollos, the, the, the Grecian, the Greek, the, from Athens. He's the one you need to listen to. And others said, no, 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 it's Peter. It's Cephas. And so they all just divided and got tore up. And some of them left the church. You know what we're saying here? It's not about anything but Jesus. This church should not be about anyone or anything except Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus that was broken for us, that we are healing, our, our, our deliverance from captivity, Everything that we have in the blessings of, Lord, of the Lord God Almighty flow through him. Your children are a heritage of the Lord, the Bible says. They're God's blessing to you is what that means. They're God's gift to you. Your family, your spouse, all the blessings flow. That's why we remember him. And then the most important thing is our soul salvation comes through him and only through him. Church is falling apart. I'll tell you one reason. They got a little old limp-wristed, sissified preacher that will stand in the full pit but won't preach nothing. Real good, feel good. Oh, I'm afraid I'll offend somebody. I'm afraid I won't offend somebody. I'm serious. If I'm sitting there, if I'm not the preacher, when I get so old that, oh, I almost said Biden, but I didn't say it. I want somebody to tell me, you don't need to be in the pulpit. You know where I want to be, Lyndon? I want to be sitting right along here with you. And I want the man of God to get in the pulpit and offend me. Because I know that I'm not, everything's not going to be just right all the time in my life. I heard today, and it, came, it was true, it's true, that a General Baptist church in this county has got a couple of women living together and raising children in, in that church, and nobody does anything about it. Churches need men to stand up and make up the gap to fill up the hedge and preach and teach the truth. Well, you know, I think that's okay. Is it okay? Is it okay for those children to grow up and believe it's okay to have two mamas? Is it okay for your children to see it in the place of worship? They're going to see it in the world. They're going to see it on YouTube. They're going to see it at school. But this place ought to be holy unto the Lord holy unto the Lord and at our best day we're going to fail but guess what because we have stood on truth God is going to be gracious to us and forgive us when we fail and fall short leadership ought to be leadership and you haven't led until somebody's following you 
Amen, Brother Gary. That's good preaching. I've already offended you, so I might as well just go on. The body of Jesus, broken for you, for me. They beat him with a, a cat of nine tails. What is that? That's a, that's a whip made out of leather, leather straps. There's nine of them. They put bone, they weave bone, they weave uh, metal and different things into those nine straps so that it cuts the blood and it cuts the flesh when they hit you. The Jews, the, the Romans, would only let you beat, be beat 39 times because they surmised that nobody could live beyond 40 and then it would be capital punishment and it would go against their laws. Paul said, I've been beat three times with 39 stripes, save one. With 40 stripes, save one, 39, under the law. You know what they did to Jesus? You know what they did? We see him on a pole. He wasn't on a pole when they beat him. They had a stump or they had a stone about that high. And they would lay them over it and they had pegs in the ground and they would pin their legs and their feet and he would be naked laying there. Oh, on his belly. While the world watched, there he was. And they would take that expert with the cat of nine tails and he, when he would hit it, and the reason they laid him down is because he could pull that thing and rip the flesh off of him. They surmised that his organs was probably showing, his kidneys. Maybe his liver was even hanging out of his back. And he endured it. Not for himself, but for me. He did it for me. I couldn't save myself. So he came to save me. And then they nailed him to a cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabatane. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look in a mirror and you got the answer. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. Do you get that? The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of man become the sons of God. That's why. And then it wasn't just his body, but he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's new. Everything's changing. The law is being fulfilled. And now there's a New Testament, a new will and testament. And the testament can't be read until the testor is dead, Right? Is that how it is? Anybody got a will in here? Don't raise your hand. That will and testament of what you wish after you die is no good until you die. This testament in his blood was no good until a few hours later when he was dead. But he said, it's in my blood. It's sealed in my blood. And some folks said, well, you know what, Mike? It's okay to drink a little bit in the church. I call them sipping saints. And there's nothing right about it. Amen. Well, the Savior drunk wine at the last, I challenge you in a King James Bible. I don't know what your Bible reads and don't care to know. But in the King James Bible, it never says wine. It never says wine. It says this cup is the New Testament in my blood. And I, if it was wine, it wasn't fermented wine. Because his blood was pure. Just why did they have unleavened bread? Because leaven is a type of sin and formation. And it spreads. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, Jesus. It spreads through the dough until the whole is leavened. And it represents, in the Bible, it represents sin. And that's what sin does. It starts out little, but it don't stay little. It starts out with a joint or just a, a puff off a joint. And then it's two joints, three joints. Oh, you really want something? You try this peel or try this hit of coke. or Oh, yeah. And you're on your way. 
You're on your way down a road that only God can bring you off of. The best, the best rehab center in the world is not worth the salt that they put on their potatoes unless Jesus Christ is the head of that rehab center. Good preaching, Brother Gary. You know what you do? I sure do. I've spent thousands of dollars on rehab. And until Jesus got a hold of him, nothing worked. And boy, is he doing good. Praise God, praise God. So it's the blood in his own blood. What kind of blood did he have? I got A positive. What you got, Lyndon, you know? Don't know. What you got? Somebody tell me. A, a, o positive. Yeah. Had it on my dog tag all through the army. A positive. Didn't have a clue what it meant. Still really don't. Just know it was A positive. I thought it was good. I'd never got an A plus before until I got my blood type back. A positive. You know what Jesus is? Boy, if they could put that and analyze it, the scientists, it would blow their mind, wouldn't it? Type divine. Type divine. How did he get his, he got it through the Holy Spirit. He got his blood type through the Holy Spirit. Right? Got it through the Holy Spirit. Nine months. That little feller was born crying and screaming and kicking. Probably was the best child ever. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't. He was innocent, just like my kids were. Just like your kids are. And then he became a man. And at the age of 30 years old, he stepped out of nowhere and began to preach and teach the, the Word of God because he was the Word of God. And then at the age of 33 and a half, he went to Jerusalem for the last Passover. And they killed him. And he shed his life blood. And it was the blood of lambs for 1,400 years that rode sin forward every year. Couldn't atone for sin. All he could do is row sin forward, row sin forward. You go to the bank and get a note, get a loan, get a note. If all you do is pay the interest, all it does is roll it forward to the next year. And then you got to pay another year's interest and it'll roll it again until the banker gets tired of fooling with you. And we got to have some principle on this thing. But it would roll sin forward. Then finally, Jesus came. And once and for all, <laughs> woo, he gave his life's blood. It didn't roll sin forward. It atones for sin. It's the remission of sin. And only he could do it. Only, only, only he could do it. He said, Brother Gary, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I did. You don't know how many times I did it. God does. Still loves you. You don't know how, you, you, you don't know how many times I backslid. God does. Well, Brother Gary, I don't know. You know what? I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I ever got saved. Let me tell you what Spurgeon said. He kind of mocked at that saying. Well, Brother Gary, I don't know if I'm hungry. Then eat. Well, I don't know if I've ate. Eat again. Well, I don't know if I'm not saved. I don't know if I'm saved. Then get on the altar and get saved. There's no disgrace. Well, I don't know if I'm thirsty. Drink some water. It won't kill you. The devil just trumps up all kind of old dumb ideals. Now, I want to tell you something. I'll be the first to tell you. If you didn't get saved, if you ain't born again, quit playing around with salvation and get it right with God. Get it right with God. I don't care if you're the deacon, the deacon's wife, the deacon's kids. I don't, it doesn't matter. I could care less and God could care less. What God is concerned about is you dying and going to hell as a deacon's kid. Wouldn't that be a shame? Had a, had a deacon years ago at Belmont. One of the finest men I ever knew in life. When I got saved, he was already in church. And man, I just kind of patterned my life as a young Christian. I'd look at him and think, boy, he was just a year or so older than me, but he was seasoned into church, you know. And, and he became a deacon of the church before I went there to pastor. 
bad things happened in his life, and I won't go into it. But he turned away from God, and he was just living a miserable life. And I'd go and pray with him, talk to him, and go by his workplace and, and go to his home. And he'd say, Gary, I'm just so ashamed. I can't go back. I'm just so ashamed. And I, I tell him, the shame would be for you to die in this mess and go to hell. That's the shame. Well, they called me, Melissa. They called me one day. His house was on fire. And I got there, and the fire had gone out. It smothered out. It just got so hot inside, and there was no air in the But we found him on his knees at his chair. He was gone. I don't know. You know, how I want to believe that he had time to just get on his knees and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That would have been good enough because he had been a saved man. He was a... Here's what I'm saying. Don't ever cut the blood of Jesus Christ short in your life. You can't, you can't say, I can't save myself for two seconds and I can't keep myself for two seconds. And if I lived another 50 years and preached the gospel for 50 more years, somebody said, oh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, it wouldn't buy me two seconds in heaven. It wouldn't. Why? Because it's by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works that God have foreordained that we should walk therein. Live right. Live right. And if you're living like hell, something's wrong. Something's wrong in your life. And you can get it right today. Before we take communion, you can get it right today. This is the blood. And Jordan, you're going to get an opportunity, buddy, for the first time to take this special service. It's up to you, but I'm telling you. That boy ain't been saved, but what? A, a week. Seven days. Ain't that special? He'd been a new creature seven days. I've been one for 50 years. I don't look new. This is special, guys. You say, well, maybe I'm not worthy. Let me ask you a question. You going to heaven? You going to heaven? Now, I'm telling you, Mike, me and you could sit here. I, Mike's about, he's my hero. I want you to know that, okay? I got several, but Mike's one of them. But we could all sit here and say, well, I've done this, or I've done that, or I had a bad thought, or, you know, I, maybe I watched something on YouTube I shouldn't have, and I heard a word I shouldn't have listened to, and... I don't believe God was talking about this. I believe he was talking about, is your soul dark? Are you committing habitual sin? Have you not got sin under the blood? And, you know, Jesus died for you. And if you're here, come on, singers, come on, Hannah, whoever. Now, I know it's been scattered and I've been chasing rabbits. I caught two. I don't know if you ever kept up with it. But I called a couple rabbits. Y'all, uh, uh, you're here. You're not a Christian. I'm telling you, I, don't, it, I could care less if you ever become a Baptist. I'd want you to be a part of this church. Jesus didn't die to make you a Baptist. He died to make you free from sin. In heaven, what will happen in heaven? You know what happened last Sunday in heaven with Jordan? I like that name. In my opinion, he's, Jordan was one of the greatest ball players to ever put on a pair of tennis shoes. Really. But that Jordan don't compare to this Jordan if that Jordan is not saved. What happened to this Jordan last Sunday is bigger than Air Nike's. It's bigger than scoring 79 points a game. It's bigger than winning the MVP year after year, rookie of the year, on and on. What happened to him? He became a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I'm telling you, all of the hell in this world can't take that away from him. Oh, hallelujah. 50 years from now, 
He'll be testifying in this church. He'll say an old preacher in black shoes with white soles. <laughs> Ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. I'm glad that that fad is over with. Told me about Jesus. And I got saved. And it only, not only mattered today, it'll matter a million years from now when he's in glory. Let's stand together. Are you here and you need salvation? Say, Brother Gary, I don't know how to pray. I didn't either. I didn't know how to pray. But I got the job done when the Holy Spirit got in my life, brother. Brother Gary, I, I, I don't know if I want to be saved. Who told you you, want to, you don't want to be saved? The devil. God wants to save you. You come on. Well, Brother Gary, I've been slave, but I'm not living right. Start living right. Come on, get your sin under the blood. Let's have church today. No excuses. Let's have church. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I, I do was too. running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt I owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the blood applied thank you Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Just come on to Jesus. While the water's troubled, God wants to save. Come on. Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. Yes. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. Amen, for I have been transformed by the blood of
Jesus we 